Welcome, everyone, to the second debate of the RSS 2020 workshop on SimTorial for Robotics. I am Florian from the Robotics Lab at Mila, Element AI, and my co-moderator is Kostas from Rutgers, uh, Rutgers University and Amazon Robotics AI. After an enjoyable debate on why we should perform SimTorial, our theme during the next 50 minutes is what is SimTorial? Is it the rehashing of old methodologies or does it stand on its own as a distinct new field? In this topic, we'll debate what people mean and don't mean by SimTorial. To do this, we are considering several overlapping methodologies or fields, such as system identification, domain randomization, and model-based RL. We've asked our debaters to take turns in defending that SimTorial goes beyond these individual fields, or defending that SimTorial comes down to an existing method. Now, uh, please note that there is a pre-poll on the RSS Virtual Conference website. Uh, to check who you think uh, is going to come out on top of this debate. And then there is another poll uh, after this debate. Uh, so please fill that out uh, to, to see if somebody state your opinion on this. Now for the structure. Thanks, Florian. Uh, we're very excited to hear the opinions of four experts in robotics on what constitutes SimTorio and uh, whether the necessary tools have already been explored in related areas. Uh, so the debate is going to be structured as follows. Uh, so Florian will introduce our four panelists, uh, two of them arguing for and two of them arguing against the proposition that the sim to real is old news. Um, note that we've asked our speakers to take a particular opinion in the debate, which may or may not reflect their personal uh, opinion. We will have the opportunity during uh, the panel for everyone to express the, their personal opinion. Each speaker will have five minutes to deliver their opening statement. We will then transition to an open discussion and wrap up the debate approximately five minutes before the end, uh, asking our speakers for a closing statement. Uh, Florian and I will moderate, but also make an effort to stay out of the debate as much as possible and interrupt if needed to make sure we remain within our time limits and that we cover different perspectives of the topic. Florian, please go ahead and introduce our speakers. So uh, our controversial statement for today will be sim to real is old news. It's just X, where X is system ID or domain randomization, what have you. And uh, the first person arguing in favor will be Jan Peters. Uh, he is known for doing policy gradients and actor critic RL methods in 2008, way before it was cool. And Jan is a full professor of intelligent autonomous systems at the computer science department of the Technische Universität Darmstadt a senior research scientist and group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, uh, where he heads the robot learning group. Thank you for joining us, Jan. All right. Thanks for that kind of introduction um, and for having me, of course. Now, let me quickly okay. rewind time. When I was an undergraduate student and I told a local professor that I wanted to do robot learning to, for my PhD, I was heavily laughed at since they said, you will never need learning and robotics. Now, today this sounds nearly absurd, but the worldview in robotics, well, rewinding time by 20 years, was, well, all we need is really accurate, nice models. We use physical principles to get them. And well, then planning can do the job. You'll not need learning, it was total bogus, because you would never get the data, you would never, it would never become useful in a way. We know today is totally, the pendulum is gone, totally overshot and there are people running around saying that, oh, well, we need, we, we can do everything by learning. We need to learn end to end. And the first thing they're challenged with is that they don't have the data to train an end to end system. So what is the solution? Oh, the solution is we just take a simulator and instead of planning algorithms, we just plug in, in now a big sampling thing and we, um, well, we basically just learn a gigantic deep learning model. And then this is incredibly ignorant when you think about it. When you look into the planning community, they have been doing sample-based planning for, well, more than 30 years. Um, the, you start from probabilistic roadmaps, whether you go into the RRTs, in the end, all of this is already sim to real. So this is in the end using a simulator to, to create a plan and well, a simulator is nothing but a forward model. And even when you take the successes of uh, current, what we consider current successes 
like let's say domain randomization or the Pegasus trick as a not so recent success. And you look into the community of, of the simulation optimization people, then you recognize that the idea of, of domain randomization is from actually the late 1960s when they already got this idea of, oh, well, we just got to add a random noise sequence to things and even reset the random generator, just like in the Pegasus trick. And voila, we have pretty much everything. So in the end, it's just, well, we're just reinventing what planning people have been doing with analytical forward models all the time. And um, well, we're not going to gain too much out of, out of making a very, very big fuss out of it. That's already my statement. I will just three minutes. I hope oh, that's thank okay. you. Great. No worries. Uh, great. Perhaps it's time then for our first uh, uh, opponent, um, uh, John Leonard, famous for his uh, pioneering work in SLAM, continuously working to make such solutions more robust to the point where he's uh, comfortable uh, putting his robots in the ocean and letting them find their way around. Uh, John is the uh, Samuel Collins Professor of Mechanical and Ocean Engineering at the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering. He's also a member of uh, MIT's uh, CSEF. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you very much. Um, this is a really great topic. And, um, you know, I want to roll the clock back even further. So I started my PhD in SLAM. We didn't call it SLAM yet in 1987 at Oxford. And my confession, I'm still working on my PhD thesis 33 years later. Um, and uh, I had two very influential folks in my early career, in addition to my advisor, Hugh Durant White, Michael Brady, who founded the robotics group at Oxford, um, he told me simulation was doomed to succeed. And uh, I think this first appeared in print by Rodney Brooks uh, in, a, in actually a, 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 head, an a head of its time book on robot learning around 1990. Um, but I, I was always mistrustful of simulations um, because it was just, it, I think robotics, so my conjecture is robotics is different uh, and sim to real is what is unique. It's the connection back to the real world. And um, the, uh, you know, for, for me, when I look back at my PhD, when I was trying to do robot localization using sonar, one of the critical things I had to do was I made a simulator of, uh, of the old Polaroid sonar. And, and to me, um, it's the module of prediction. It's the ability to predict what sensor data should I um, get from my robot as it moves through the world? And how should the world change as I interact with objects uh, in the world? And um, I was very skeptical of simulation, say, through the 90s or uh, the subsequent years. But now in 2020, I've kind of had a change of heart because um, I'm involved uh, in my work with Toyota, for example, in putting robots out in the world where we want to build you know, very safe cars. And we want to have robots that we can trust them uh, um, to be deployed in, in unknown environments and um, dealing with all the edge cases and rare events. And I think we will never have the ability to capture enough data um, to, to sort of be able to capture all sort of scenarios, that, you know, sort of the um, many, many miles that are driven each year worldwide, all the unexpected events. But I think we do have the potential to do this in simulation if we have simulators that really can connect back to real. So, um, so, so my view is that um, sim to real should be sort of a branded sub-discipline in uh, robotics. For example, ICRA should have sessions on sim to real, uh, and we should bring together, uh, it should be a worthy endeavor to create good simulators. Um, for example, the work that Encore has done, uh, and that you can um, make, um, as long as we have the to real part, we can connect it back to the real world and evaluate it. Um, I think there is something unique about closing the loop with the real world with a robot that a robot can do that that is quite different than than um, for example some of the machine learning work based on processing data sets like the kitty data set or ImageNet or some of the planning that work, work that uh, happens purely in a simulated world. Um, uh, another thing that we have in 2020 that we didn't have uh, couldn't have dreamed of 30 years ago is the amazing GPU technology. And I think there is something different now about our ability to do the physically realistic simulations. Um, and, I, and I think that um, the, the, uh, the, the real, I think, frontier of knowledge in, in, a, in a field like SLAM that I work on in terms of mobile robot navigation in the world is the capability to deal with dynamic agents in the world. You know, driving in a crowded downtown urban city dealing with police officers waving their hands and pedestrians and 
people on scooters and cyclists. And um, the, the, the enterprise of prediction, prediction with uncertainty, and not just like sort of a Gaussian model of uncertainty, but more general expressive models of uncertainty. Will that car turn left? Will that pedestrian step into the crosswalk or not? And to me, um, that prediction capability that we're going to need to be safely interacting with dynamic agents in the world, it, it actually is the enterprise of simulation. And, I, and let me go a little further. I believe we have prediction engines in our head, um, sort of like the sort of, um, if you think about like the autonomic processes of like a beating heart where you can't really control your beating heart, there's sort of the conscious level of intelligence, like how we think we go through the world. But I believe there's sort of a, a, a subconscious kind of prediction engine that's always running with lots of crazy different hypotheses. And it's the thing that might stop you from stepping out into the road if you're in a city where they drive on the other side of the road, for example. Um, and, and it's this kind of capability to have simulators so good that they can predict uh, what happens in the real world. I, I think that's what we need for robotics and, and not just motion, but also ultimately contact and deformable surfaces and fluids. And so um, uh, I'll wrap up and say um, it is different this time and sim to real will be the defining tool uh, of the next 10 years as we attack the prediction problem in robotics. Thank you, John. Uh, next up, we have our second proponent, uh, Martha White. Uh, her primary research goal is to develop techniques for adaptive autonomous agents learning on streams of data. She's advancing representation learning for reinforcement learning. You may know her from her foundation work on off-policy actor critic and temporal difference methods. And her, paper, uh, her papers tend to, uh, tend to be filled with equations and proofs that are way above my paper. Martha is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. Thanks for joining us, Martha. Thank you for having me. Um, all right, so I'm, you know, I come from the model-based RL community. So I'm gonna be talking about how sim to real and model-based RL are very related and how actually some of the work that maybe is being done in sim to real has been done in model-based RL and is also being tackled now in a more modern way. So I guess I have to start by saying what I mean by sim to real because we might all have different definitions. And to me, sim to real is the goal of saying, I wanna train an agent offline in a simulator because you know, I'm gonna work really hard on making that simulator accurate and I don't wanna to interact too much in a dangerous world and then I'm gonna deploy that static policy. So this type of approach really was standard in model-based RL in an area called Approximate Dynamic Programming or ADP. And this, an ADP is really saying, if I had a model, someone handed me a nice model of the world, but I have lots of states or I have lots of actions, it's gonna be difficult to do full dynamic programming where dynamic programming means things like value iteration or policy iteration. This is going to be intractable, so we're going to do approximate dynamic programming, and we're going to solve real problems using approximate dynamic programming. So a lot of really interesting work, for example, came out of Warren Powell's group. Um, they actually scheduled large fleets of trucks for a company where they built a model using historical data. <clears throat> that model had lots and lots of states and actions, but they were actually able to get a really good policy out of it and deploy that policy and use that policy in the real world. So ADP has been... Uh, really successful, I would say, when a good model can actually be specified. And that's usually the case when models are tabular and these decisions are, say, higher level decisions like scheduling action decisions rather than, say, low level continuous action control, or in cases where you can actually get a really good model, like a physics model, or you have some, a mathematical model of how something should work. Um, but now when you move to other types of settings where maybe it's harder to get a really accurate model, uh, maybe it's it, that to this type of approach has not been as popular. And in fact, this is really where reinforcement learning has worked on the model free setting, precisely because the modeling the world is just too complex. So here actually I'm going to give also a quote from Warren Powell, since he's um, really been, I would say, one of the people who has used something like model based RL in the real world with a true model. And his quote is, the reinforced learning community often requires a model-free framework since the community is working on problems that involve mimicking human behavior. And the control theory community often encounters model-free applications when the physics of a particular problem is simply too complex to represent as a mathematical model. So he's also sort of acknowledging that when the model is difficult to get, then you start to start moving towards these model-free settings. So now moving a little bit more into, well, if in reinforcement learning, uh, we're not using models as much, how is that related to sim to real? Well, we still wanna take advantage of the fact that the world has this nice structure. We have this transition dynamics, we know the agent is sort of transitioning between states. So we wanna take advantage of that, but we also wanna acknowledge that learning the model is hard. 
So there's been this consistent theme in reinforcement learning that small errors in the model can result in big errors in learning the value function. So when our agent goes and starts learning a model of the world, um, we're, we, we try really hard to get a really accurate model and then we get really disappointed when we see um, failure. And actually we have a recent work on this where we tried to investigate something we call the hallucinated value hypothesis, where we learn a very accurate model, but we just have one transition that leads to a state that is not possible. So it's a simulated state that doesn't exist. And then the agent bootstraps off of estimates in that um, you know, not real state and it results in catastrophic failure. So the direction in RL has been to say, well, we really want to use models, but we, we are not always going to have perfectly accurate models. So instead, we're going to try to supplement learning in the real world. So the agent always has to have real experience. We still want to take advantage of an imperfect model. And that's where there's been a really big push towards instead things like selective planning, where your agent learns a model of the world, but it tries to acknowledge where it has good estimates, where it has bad estimates, and only uses planning in parts of the world that it has more accurate estimates or things like value aware models where we say, well, let's not even bother learning a full true model. I'm not gonna learn an actual simulator of the world. Instead, I'm gonna learn some kind of abstract model that just tells me something that's good enough to predict what my value is gonna be in the next state. Okay, so I'll wrap it up by saying that model-based approaches where a model is given, or if you can learn a really accurate model is very similar or maybe the same as sim to real. And the more modern usage where we really mean the agent is gonna learn a model as part of its solution and also learn from experience is also maybe the direction that sim to real is going next. So more modern model-based RL could also be seen as something that's being done in sim to real. Thank you. Great, so it's time to get to the second opponent, uh, Greg Dudek. He's known for his book, Computational Principles of Mobile Robotics, that's used for teaching uh, robotics in many universities and his works on multi-robot collaboration and exploration. Uh, he also likes uh, to throw his robots into the ocean like John. Uh, Greg Dudek is a James McGill professor with the School of Computer Science of McGill University and VP of Research and Lab Head for Samsung's AI Center in Montreal. He's the Scientific Director of Canada's National Robotics Network and former Director of the NSERC Canadian Field Robotics Network, former Director of the McGill School of Computer Science and former Director of McGill's Research Center for Intelligent Machines. He also directs the McGill Mobile Robotics Laboratory. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Um, so, uh, you know, on the subject of sim to real, I think it's a critically timing, timely subject during the pandemic right now when many of us are forced to build uh, simulation, simulation systems and we really want them to work in the real world. I think simula sim to real and the idea of addressing the inevitable reality gap between simulation and reality has emerged as a really important new first class problem. And I think it lives right at the confluence of robotics and machine learning. And I think by calling it out as a topic in its own right, we identify and aggregate research and researchers with a whole set of common concerns. And that's, I think, why it's so important to do that aggregation and to identify that nomenclature. Uh, it's about simulation uh, and about constructing, not just about constructing real systems, but about acknowledging that disparity and considering and addressing it and trying to figure out how to deal with it. I think notably and historically, a large part of the research world doesn't trust any res result that's supported only by simulation. And like, why was that true? And why has it been true for so long? It's due to the challenges, the inherent challenges in addressing that reality gap, getting things from simulation to truly work on fully realistic systems. And I think that trend is changing, but it's because of the explicit acknowledgement of that gap and because of, I think, the field that we call sim to real to a large measure. Uh, any, any areas, notably sim to real can be restructured as some combination of existing domains. We can split them apart in some reductionist way. But I think this kind of neologism is really valuable and meaningful when we want to bring together people and unify them in addressing some common challenge. I think the importance of simulation to robotics and, and, and actually both engineering and science of robotics is the relationship between simulation models and the underlying real world systems. And that's indisputable. And it's been a key aspect of scientific progress for a long time since simulation first became feasible. Um, and, uh, and I think we, if we want things to coalesce into new domains, that's a natural part of, of the scientific uh, process. John took us back to his PhD, and I want to look back even further for a second. And so only in the last century did we see computer science emerge as a discipline. And I've been told how recalcitrant uh, engineers at some well-known local university were opposed to having a department of computer science because that supposed discipline was just a collection of engineering tools. And, and they actually said, we don't need a department of spreadsheets. And I think that kind of narrow-minded focus and 
unwillingness to acknowledge how things come together in new ways is, I think, just really problematic. And it's, uh, it's rarely beneficial, much like the position of our esteemed opponents in this debate. I think likewise control theory emerges as, as people realize the commonality and the value of this suite of related tools and, and methods that define the field. And so, um, you know, not, not every neologism like that is going to persist and flourish forever. It doesn't have, we don't have to have sim for real for a hundred years. Cybernetics was tremendously influential as a field, but those ideas got absorbed and redistributed in other parts of science. But for the time that cybernetics existed as a field in itself, it was tremendously important. And, and, uh, and I think likewise, on a slightly smaller scale, deep learning has developed into a well-defined discipline of its own that we all acknowledge. And it's tremendously important that that is called out as a thing. I think what makes sim to real suitable for intellectual partitioning of its own is the richness and complexity that it embodies today. In some application areas, the challenges encompassed by sim to real are just hard instances of fairly classical methods. What's notable about sim to real and robotics specifically is that the reality gap is really big and really problematic. And the complexity of both the underlying simulation as well as the real world system is vast. Um, and as a result of that, but there's little expectation of closing the gap in many real cases. Uh, you know, if you're doing weather modeling, the reality gap is just ascribed to some incomplete models and we should improve the weather model and fix it up. And that's a problem. For sim to real, the vast array of exogenous factors, outside forces, wheel to ground contact, stiction, perception, human interaction, all of those things make a truly faithful and complete simulation almost impossible to achieve in the short term, except in very, very narrow domains. And I think, uh, I think that multifaceted nature of robotics is really important. If you're talking about chess playing, then we don't need a discipline called sim to real. Not, but, but not many modelers who are using Mojoko, for example, are gonna want to deal with modeling battery depletion and ROS2 communication glitches and drive belt slippage and uh, uh, lots of other things that happen in the real world. And yet that reality gap is part of what you need to make systems really work. And so I think the challenges of crossing the reality gap in robotics are large, and there are a wide ensemble of common issues that, uh, that unify the people like us that are addressing them. And I think the theorists and practitioners have a need to interact, and that's the essence, essence of having an explicitly defined sub-area. And more pragmatically, submitting a paper on these issues to some arbitrary venue under the heading of just domain randomization only or system identification is easily gonna to lead to a very unfortunate outcome for some robotics practitioners. And I think that also is unfortunate. You really want reviewers who are able to appreciate the diversity and complexity of the subdomain that you're in. Uh, so finally, sim real has developed and is developing its own ensemble of concerns spanning several traditional subfields, its own selected literature, its own focus on certain underlying evaluation and validation methods, and thus its own community. And that's what it means to be an area. And thus I would submit that it is a distinct area of scientific inquiry and to claim the contrary is just reactionary. Great, uh, thank you. So, so now that uh, we've concluded with the opening remarks, it's time for some open discussion and perhaps we can go back to our uh, first uh, speaker, Jan, and have an opportunity perhaps to um, provide his, his counterpoints. And uh, you know, it seems that uh, John and, and Greg brought up um, you know, their excitement about having seemed to realize an uh, independent field that it, uh, we will actually will not be making progress in robotics unless we really address the, the reality gap. Don't you feel the same? I think a simulator is obviously a super tool for debugging, but um, this the getting, I mean, this reality gap, Greg, you, you mentioned so many of the, the typical things we encounter, but it's, it's sometimes so amazing how when the moment when you use a simulator and you have really trained a behavior in a simulator how easily the simulation optimization bias as it's called is actually hitting you so i'll give you a very simple example so for a barrett wem model if you use a really realistic friction model addition so one which is obtained by data and doesn't really fully make physical sense but is really really descriptive and you train now a policy in it, then this, um, this policy will start to exploit mechanisms which are not actually physical. I mean, they exist in the data, but they don't, they, they don't extrapolate um, to regimes you would never try when you're trying to generate the data. And when you try to, uh, try to, uh, you would never have on the long run. I mean, similar to the theoretically infinite contact forces which you can have 
thanks to uh, well in analytical mechanics which never exist obviously in real physics because your system actually will break when you have infinite near infinite forces and you can have things like small you know very very small errors there and these tiny errors create gigantic ex big, um, disturbances so that even trying something on that uh, well that uh, even try closing on the big issues the gap will already be uh, will be impossible but on small issues they already may have devastating results because of the simulation optimization bias. Like for the first week when I started my group, um, well, t quite a few years ago, um, well, more hair and less white ones. And I was just trying to make a really, really fast success. So I wanted to learn on a complete sim to real uh, framework and run it on the robot. All looked great. And when I ran it on the robot, it did this, bang, right into the joint limits. Uh, and the behavior was clear and stable. And it took me like weeks of debugging to figure out that there was a tiny, a tiny element in this friction function, which I've just been mentioning, which killed it, which completely, um, which allowed my simulate, my optimizer, my learning method to create a solution, which was never going to be physically realistic because it believed that it could actually pump free energy out of um, a small parasitary effect. And um, well, it was the learning method was doing a really, really good job. But um, the simulator was really, really accurate. Up, well, in the, really in the tenth of a percent accurate. And it still killed it. So the, it's not just about making the simulation accurate. It's really also the, we have this complete opposition here that when we learn the policy in the simulator that will exploit the little things which are not physical. So we would actually have to figure out and would have to figure out something completely different too. That is how can we actually make sim to real approaches that are um, well defying, but which are making sure that we never do physics and grow away accuracy again in order to become more physical. And maybe we've grown, and I think at that point we have thrown the baby out with water. I think you've made a good argument for why we really need this discipline, right? The simulation, obviously we need it. It's critical. Reality, we can't do without it most of the time. Closing that gap really needs extensive, serious attention. And that focus between that on that gap is, I think, what SimTorial is all about, whether it's domain randomization or some other technique. I think no single technique that we have now is enough to completely address that. And that's why there's a, a serious need for an area. Maybe if I can jump in then, since maybe we're going to be alternating. Um, it, I guess maybe part of this is a question of what exactly is meant by sim to real. Um, I feel like there's sort of maybe two definitions here. I suggested that maybe it was training in a simulator and then deploying some kind of static policy. But I think John was suggesting that maybe there's more of a interleaving with real experience and trying to um, use a simulator in that way. So I suppose is sim to real a problem setting or is it a solution strategy? And if it's a solution strategy, then I suppose whenever you define a field and say we are going to wholeheartedly pursue the solution strategy as a community, then we have to know what are the flaws with the solution strategy and should we be working on it. Whereas if we say that this is a problem setting, like you know, the problem is actually to be sample efficient with experience or to make sure our agents don't do unsafe things, then that's the actual problem setting. So maybe I would pose, is this a solution strategy or is it a problem setting? John, do you want to take this? Okay. Um... I guess it's a little bit of both, but I'll, I'll go with a solution strategy. And I think um, listening to, to, to the comments, um, I think that sim to real is a, is a thing and also real to sim needs to be a thing. We need to sort of completely close the loop and go sim to real to sim. And by that, what I mean is we use experiments in the real world to improve and generalize our simulators. And so it shouldn't be just like a one-way path because that's when you get into the trouble of your algorithm is going to kind of learn some artifact. And learning about sort of artifacts on the data, as say Jan was discussing, um, that, that happens in sort of um, other domains as well. For example, uh, there was a compelling paper, I think, from CVPR last year that talked about um, detecting vehicles on a highway with a data set like Kitty. And apparently the machine learning algorithms were, were, were honing in on the shadow cast underneath the car. And so if you replaced a car with a refrigerator uh, in the middle of the road, it wouldn't detect it in terms of, say, trying to do depth for mono. And um, uh, if um, I think what we need to do is if we have the ability to sort of 
close the loop and go back from the real world experiment so that the simulators are almost uh, self-building, self-healing, self-generalizing, um, then, then you could have this amazing tool. It could be almost as powerful as a telescope in terms of just opening up whole new avenues because um, ultimately it's about making impact on the real world. And I think if you could achieve this sim to real to sim capability where your simulator got better and better through the real world and vice versa, uh, that, then that, that I think could really accelerate our progress as roboticists. Yeah, I, I would normally accept that as just part of the definition of the domain, that, that you know, addressing that gap in both directions is intrinsic to the problem. I think it's a great statement. But how is that different to adaptive control? I mean, haven't they, we seen this like 30 something years back when people said, oh, we just got to do adaptive control where we um, have our model be updated online and we then use the plan, an adaptive, well, we use an adaptive feedback control and an adaptive planner on on that model, is there any difference? I think it's dramatically different. I think once you've sort of written down the math of your control problem and say, these are the parameters that we're gonna allow to be kind of adapted, um, you know, we're working on problems where you can't just write down the model. And so like once you've, once you've written down the model, you've honed in on a very sort of narrow um, uh, kind of sub problem with lots of built-in assumptions that are gonna break there down. There were people who did adaptive control with the non-parametric representations, with representations which are completely open, with neural networks. I mean, all of this happened in the 80s. So nobody's saying we shouldn't use adaptive control, right? It's a, a tremendously it's powerful open. tool. But the thing is, we're never gonna get the reality gap small enough that just adaptive control is gonna solve many of these problems. I mean, you just talked about how hard it is to go from simulation to the real world system. And I don't think if I said, oh, yeah, and that problem of yours, just use adaptive control, you would have slapped me in the face. True. Um, I'm just saying that the, all the arguments I hear for sim to real are typically the, the one of which somebody who, uh, who basically like, like Farrelly, uh, I'm sorry, Farrell, he's why am I making him Italian now? So Fer Jay Farrell, for example, when you look into his book about approximate adaptive control, from which summarizes basically everything since the 80s up to the year 2000 something. It's, it's all in there, you know, even with the neural network representations, all the non-parametric ones. And it's basically just already full, full fledged sim to real. So, so how does perception fit into that kind of textbook? You know, how does, how does kind of knowing this is a coffee mug and it's, if I pour it, the coffee that I haven't drunk yet is going to pour out onto the ground. And how does it deal with sort of deformable objects and sheets of paper? And could it handle kind of writing and um, writing on the chalkboard? Um, even the juggling behind you, you know, make it um, um, make it a robot that's walking up the stairs and trying to juggle. You know, can you write down the math uh, that it that that textbook can solve it? I don't. I think I don't think so. I think we need yeah, something that's more open ended. Yes. But again, let's not talk about these guys as if they were just doing analytical equations. Um, they used, I mean, using neural networks and adaptive control happened in the 80s, right? It's something we shouldn't forget. Yeah, they were thinking about these things. They just didn't have the computational power which we have today. I would also argue that if the, if this, the definition is actually that we're going to close this loop, then model-based RL really, that's exactly what we're trying to do there, where we put the model as part of the, as part of the solution within the agent. The agent is going to try to learn the model. Maybe we give it the best model we currently have, and it's going to refine that model. But it's constantly interacting with the world, doing planning in the background, and updating its model. And this is sort of exactly what the model-based RL community is exploring. Um, I would argue, I, I suppose, still that the sim real one then it could be a larger superset, even though that's arguing against my case, because you may not want to use reinforcement learning. Maybe you want to use other control strategies where you do this loop with the model. But nonetheless, the same kinds of issues are gonna come up in the two communities. Absolutely, I, I wouldn't dispute that. I think just the thing is, it's useful to have this terminology, sim to real in this community because it brings together adaptive control, model-based control, perception, systems engineering, many of these things, even HRI a little bit, right? Although it's not so much part of the paradigm now, domain randomization. These things need to be aggregated. They're not gonna go away. It's just a matter of putting them together so that we can talk to each other more readily. I mean, I used to know George Zames, who's a control theorist who came up with H-Infinity. And he used to claim to me, you know, semi-seriously, that everything was really just uh, uh, 
H infinity control basically took care of all of computer vision and all of robotics. I mean, of course, that's not true. We can see the whole world through our little lens, as that's a thing we all kind of do sometimes, but it's not necessarily useful to look at things that way. I can go back to what Jan said about um, sort of the um, pioneering work in adaptive control and neural networks. I don't by any means mean to be critical. Like I, uh, I'm a true believer if I've, you know, if we have seen further it's due to standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, and as the field makes progress, um, those early kind of efforts and pioneers, we, we want to inherit and, and extend all those capabilities. Um, one thing that, that comes to mind is, you know, like I remember going to one, ICRA in 1988, you know, when it had a few hundred people in Philadelphia. And um, I remember the, going uh, to primary school at that time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, and, uh, and with, um, you know, thousand there are fields have grown so big which is which is a wonderful kind of success story you know young academics are looking where to make an impact you know and i think uh, it would be a kind of risky career move but if someone held out their hand and said you know what i'm going to turn sim to real into an actual in-depth discipline that touches on all these different topics and draws on these historical contributions um you know it, it may actually be that you know it, you know 10 years from now we'll have you know, 10 sessions on Sim to Real at ICRA, uh, and it will have enabled things that we couldn't, that would be just really hard now. And, and it's actually, one of the, uh, one other thing I'll say is in robotics, we tend to sort of fall into our kind of sub communities and not cross uh, in terms of the, um, you know, like someone could spend lots of times in localization and mapping sessions or manipulation sessions. Um, but this topic actually brings us together. I think it actually spans many of the different kind of subdisciplines of robotics, and it's a way to create a sort of cross-disciplinary learning and culture if we could create tools that generalize to all these different problems. So I like this bringing together, but I also already see the, the opposite happening. Like when you look at, at this example behind us, we, we sent this to RSS this year, and we said, oh, Kia, look, great, model-free learning on the real system, learns how to juggle, um, algorithms work really well, you need very, very few trials, and even very little deep learning. And we got back reviews saying, oh, you guys should have just worked in simulation, and it's the, the real component, it's sim to real can be done completely in simulation, and that sim that's much more important, you would have been much faster, Instead of um, several hundred trials, you would have taken just three and you could have, should have done everything in simulation. So we, we got to fight for the real component more than the sim component, I think, if you really want to bring that, people together. I, I think that's true, but I think the fact that people would say such an outrageous thing is symptomatic. I mean, really the same thing. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, yeah, I've never gotten three bad reviews at the time. Uh, <laughs> except if, if, if you're... If your paper was rejected at RSS, you're joining a company of uh, amazing, accomplished people. Like Michael Case has never had a paper accepted at RSS, and I would put that body of seven papers up against anyone else's. You know, uh, it's it's uh, uh, you know I think that you know we, we simulation is doomed to succeed on its own, and we do need the real part. And I think the failure to appreciate the disparity between doing it only in simulation and doing it only in reality, it's why, in a way, you want this community to exist so that when you send a paper review, the, re the right reviewers look at it and can appreciate that gap. So I'm going to come back in then saying if, it's, if this is both, I think John said it's both an al algorithmic strategy and it's a problem setting. Well, if, it's, if it's sort of an algorithmic strategy, sim to real is, I think, could actually narrow the view that people have for solving this problem because it's sort of emphasizing that you should really focus on getting a very good simulator so that it can then transfer to the real world. So I, I mean, would dispute that. You would dispute that. Uh, completely, if completely. I mean, if you, you, first of all, you can't. It's just not gonna happen for many, many problem domains. And secondly, that's not sim to real. I mean, that's, there is no sim to real and that's just making a perfect simulator, which, you know, it, it's just such a remote pipe dream that I don't even have to worry about it. You know, I do underwater robotics or things that drive through the forest. When we can simulate all that perfectly, I'm going to be 250 in my robot body. Or at least maybe it puts a lot of emphasis on the simulator, on training in the simulator in isolation, and then maybe going to the real setting rather than having the model be as part of the agent. And I'll just give one example why I think this distinction is important. Um, for example, if you're trying to learn something like a simulator, you're going to try to make it make predictions about observations in the real world, like something about images or about some sensory data. If it's a model, then you might actually choose to make the model in terms of abstract states in subjective within the agent. 
And then you're learning very different types of models. It's difficult to call those simulators anymore because they're extremely internal to the agent. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we would now like to uh, give every speaker an opportunity uh, for about one minute to make a closing statement. And I'd like you to go in the same order you did the opening statements. Uh, so, Jan, first, please. Okay. Well, my plaidoyer now, before that, I've been obviously arguing a point which well, you asked me to argue, um, totally against Simtoreal. So, I, I still, I mean, I think you should always be suspicious of models. Um, and I think that's one thing every roboticist who works with the real systems um, learns very fast as a, as a solution. But I think is what we have failed so far in robotics is to actually try to look again, look into this aspect of that when you're doing something, you're gaining typically model knowledge all the time. So you. What you really want to do is you want to be able to create well, a series of, of guarantees on your models which become tighter. So for example, you want to have, up, have, you have a simulation bias, you can actually make guarantees of um, how that simulation bias starts to shrink um, if you keep incorporating observations in the right way. If you look at the dual control people, um, a dead community today, but um, they actually got really fundamental, interesting insights in the 1960s of how to do control with models which are being optimal control with models which are being updated. And their insights actually more interesting than the stuff which happened in the Bayesian RL community. They're really largely overlooked when you, you study them in detail. And they had many of the ideas we currently treasure a lot, like entropy regularization, such kind of things as well already. And you should really start to um, to um, st to st not only now find these guarantees about that if you keep updating our simulator, but really to um, make plans at how simulators need to improve during this inter interweaving of first training on a simulator, running things on the real world, incorporating whatever we learned on the real world in back into the simulator, so that it actually becomes like a generalization to adaptive control with a lot of dual control influence, basically. Um, so that would be my hope for Simtory in the future. And thanks for reminding me of that. So I, um, I really appreciate that, what you said. I, I, I would go back to uh, simulation is prediction. And uh, my dream is to to build robots that have long-term autonomy that can operate for very long durations of time, multiple days, weeks, months, and get better over time. And I have this kind of um, paradigm in my head, I call it a robot dreaming. Like imagine a robot that wanders around a college campus every day for six or eight hours and goes back and plugs itself in to recharge overnight. And it's sort of like um, dreaming about everything that happened that day or maybe crazy things that might or could happen, but it's effectively training its simulator. It's, it's enabling the ability to make better prediction, predictions the next day. I think intelligence is prediction. And um, the, um, and, but if I do have a worry, or can, uh, my time's up, but uh, I, an open question is, will we have explicitly programmed simulators or will neural networks sort of take over the domain of simulation and, and they will be more of a kind of a black box? And, and that kind of scares me because I, I, I want simulators that we can trust and that can get them, make themselves better, but somehow aren't just a black box. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Martha. Um, all right, there's lots of things to say. Uh, I guess I'll start by saying that I, I really like the idea of policing terminology. If sim to real is a way to bring people together to work on the idea of how do we learn with learned models, I think that would be a, a beautiful thing to do. But I do think a term like learning with learned models would be less um, scoping the focus that people would have and would bring more of these communities together. Uh, I also care a lot about continual learning. I don't work on robotics, but I do wanna work on agents that are always interacting with the world. And I actually am starting to work a little bit on robotics. And uh, I also think intelligence is a lot about prediction. Um, so if we can all work together to figure out how can we put in some kind of prior knowledge into our models, which seems like a very reasonable place to be building in some prior knowledge, but also allow the agents 
to update that model to become more tailored to their own learning. Um, I think that would be a wonderful direction forward. I do think that the view of sim to real is sort of what John just said, that you really want to have something you can trust. So that's the place where you'd like to try to control what's going to happen so the agent can't do crazy things. Um, but I think the notion of control on our agents or, or preventing learning in an online way is precluding one of the most powerful things about learning, which is online adaptation. So I think at some point we're going to have to be willing to accept that the agent is going to go beyond something that we understand and that the model is going to become tailored to it and we may not understand anymore what the model is. That's all I want to I mean, say. I, yeah, I think all of the other uh, debaters brought up a set of tremendous points. I mean, it's, it's, you know, clearly we have a very common view of some of the things that have to be done. I think the key point I'd like to make is that I think having this term symptom real that defines a community is incredibly useful, right? If we think about things like hierarchical simulation, which I think is really some, one of the things we want to think about going forward as well. We want very, you know, fit it, simulators with the best fidelity we can get, but they often might be expensive either to build or to use. And so having a, a hierarchy of simulation that is useful or combining perception and planning or thinking about coping with failure and how to do adaptation in the presence of very rare events and failure or thinking about domain shift or transfer learning or safety guarantees, those set of issues together, I think define a sub area that gets us from the absolutely critical world of simulation to the absolutely pivotal world of the reality, right? In the end, the whole point is to get to reality. And I think simulation alone, of course, without reality is just, you know, pointless. And so it's closing that gap. And that gap is where a huge amount of action is. And it's constantly being underestimated historically. And it's only now that people are really starting to focus specifically on how to get from here to there. And getting from here to there is not just about shrinking the gap. Of course, we all want to do that. But that alone is, that's not enough alone because I don't think we can do it. So come to the sim to real world. Great, thank you. <laughs> uh, this was a really enjoyable uh, debate. Thank you for participating. Uh, we're going to see you uh, hopefully uh, all again uh, later on uh, Sunday dur during uh, the panel. And uh, I would like to remind our audience that they can uh, uh, go online and uh, vote their opinion on, on this topic. And perhaps we can see whether uh, the for or the against side move the needle in the uh, you know, audience's uh, opinion. Uh, thanks again. I enjoyed this uh, debate as, as the previous one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.